I was born in 1971, and I suppose what I'm going to talk about came out just a few years before, but like television today, before there was streaming where you could binge watch all the, the shows from season one to season 25 or whatever they are these days, we still, back in the day, had what they called reruns, and the cartoons of the late 60s were still very prevalent in my generation. Hanna-Barbera was well known for a lot of different cartoons uh, back in the day. You had uh, the Flintstones, you had the Jetsons, you had Yogi Bear and Hey Boo Boo Boy, and you had Wacky Races. Anybody remember Wacky Races up here? You had Dick Dastardly, and Muttley. And Muttley is the one that really stands out. He had this distinctive kind of... <laughs> it was just like a raspy, wheezing laugh. Uh, and he was always... They, they were the villains of the show. There was this race that was always going on. And Dastardly had uh, a pretty good vehicle, but he always was trying to sabotage the others to ensure his success. But kind of like the coyote with Bugs Bunny... You know, they would go through these great lengths, but their, their plots would never work. And it was the same with Dastardly and Muttley. And there would always be, Muttley was supposed to be Dastardly's little uh, minion, and he, would, he was a minion before mi being a minion was cool, apparently. Uh, and he went out there, and he would try to do all these things, but the, the plans would never work. And inevitably, Dastardly would issue his signature line, Curses! Foiled again! And that was the line. <laughs> I, I, I still kind of remember that as a kid. That was, uh, the, by the way, the guy who did the voice for Dick Dastardly, you might have known him later on as Gargamel, uh, who did the voice uh, on the Smurfs show, which is just a nice little trivia fact for you. I suppose if it ever comes in job, up in jeopardy someday, you'll thank me for that. <laughs> but why would he say curses? Because the curse around him, it, he had done so much effort to try to be successful, but his plans ultimately were thwarted. Things didn't happen like he foresaw them going, and the others went through their success, and he went through failure and dismay because things had not gone according to his intent. That is what in a more serious vein, God is warning Adam and Eve is going to happen now to the world and to their own decisions, inevitably, not that there will never be times of success, not that there will ever be times of blessing and grace, but you need to expect that there are things working against you. There are going to be pain and sorrow. There is going to be hardship and difficulty, and you have brought these things on because of who you are and what you have done. And the consequences that Adam and Eve would reap coming out of the garden, being cast out of the presence of God, friends, are still things that we must deal with today. And so this isn't just an ancient story. This is helping us to understand why does the world work the way it does today? And we have our first parents to thank for that. So let's read the passage. We'll read verses 16 through 19 of Genesis chapter 3. I'll be reading this morning from the English Standard Version. Hear the word of God. And God says to the woman, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. 
This is the Word of God, inerrant, infallible, inspired, written by God and written for us that we might know what to believe, that we might know how to live, and then on its pages we might meet the living Christ. May God add His blessing to the reading of His Word this morning. We understand here from this passage that God upholds justice. That's what I want you to see, first of all, that He is not being belligerent or provocative. He has given them warnings. In the day that you eat of it, In the day that you eat of this fruit and disobey me, you will die. And as we've made a case here over the last couple of weeks, God is still showing grace and mercy toward Adam and Eve. He's getting ready to cast them out of the garden. He's getting ready to put a wall, a barrier in their relationship. But they will be leaving the garden still breathing. They will be leaving the garden with still the opportunity to express remorse and repentance for what they have done. Their relationship with God will be hindered, but they will still have a relationship with God. God graciously provides them with clothing. God graciously continues to interact with them, maybe in limited ways, but He's still revealing Himself to them. He still loves and cares about them, even as he also is describing for them the difficulty of what their actions have brought upon themselves and upon their descendants, the consequences which they deserve for their decision. And we begin with seeing what God's judgment is for the woman, what God's judgment is for the woman. It details this clearly in the passage where God says to Eve, who, by the way, has not yet been named, she is never going to be called Eve until the end of the chapter, where we, read, where we stopped our reading in verse 19. Adam is going to give her the name in verse 20 in just a moment. Until now, she has been the woman. And to the woman, God says, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. I recently saw that the associate pastor I worked with uh, for the last three and a half years in uh, Alton, Illinois, previously to coming here, uh, Eric Lloyd and his wife Kim recently delivered, I guess this is their fifth child now, they had three girls just like we did, and then the Lord blessed them now with one and now two sons. Uh, And so, Uh, I said something to my wife the other day. Hey, look, it looks like Eric had another kid. Uh, We were watching on Facebook, and she gives me the look. She didn't even have to say it, because you know that she's thinking, Eric didn't have to do anything in that process. That was all on Kim. (laughs) And yes, there was a contribution, I suppose we could say. And yes, Eric is going to bear some parental responsibility. But when... A couple is having a child. It's not infrequent for the woman to say, you don't deserve any of the credit because you are not going through anything. Uh, I'll I'll spare you some of the stories that I could tell uh, about our child delivery processes. But I'll just say the last three, Jennifer has enjoyed more of my experience uh, than what she experienced with the first four because we've adopted. (laughs) And so there's that benefit. But... I think at the same time, we need to understand what is God talking about when he said, what, was it going to be all fun and games and before the, before the curse, was there going to be no physical discomfort at all? We, we can't really say because there were no children born before the fall. But I can't envision the way that biology works that it wouldn't have at least been challenging or you wouldn't have known what was going on. I think at the same time, what we do have to understand is unpleasant as the childbirthing process is for the the woman. And as I watched my wife go through it, I'm so thankful that I'm a man. (laughs) I, I won't deny that either. But I will also say this, as a parent and having gone through now seven children in our household, not to mention all the foster children that have gone through before, you know that beyond the experience of bringing a child into the world, going through the birthing process, as intense as it is, 
It's also accompanied at the end with great joy, with great anticipation of all the potential that's there. And I know that my wife, having gone through that, does not regret having gone through that. There is a joy, a delight to welcome those children into the world. And yet, we would also acknowledge that as we've seen children growing up in our home, that the pain didn't just happen in those first few moments when they entered into the world or through those nine months of carrying the child and all the changes that went through the body and all those other things. There is turmoil. There is heartache. There is disappointment. Even the parent with the best child in their household experiences a measure of conflict. There is no parent who has a child who is always compliant. There is a demand on one's heart, a demand on one's demeanor, whether we always handle it well or not as parents. There is a pain that goes through a parent when they are trying to guide a child in the way that that child should go. There is disappointment. There is heartache. There are sleepless nights. There is anxiety and worry. There is multiplication that has come through because of our sin nature. David would say, the psalmist, that I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. That is, no child comes into this world, as much as it might like, seem like to us, pure and innocent and perfect. Every child is born into this world carrying the sin nature of his father or her father, Adam. And that is the reality. We've talked about this before in this series recently. But those sins, those difficulties, the way that a child thinks also causes pain, disappointment, and anxiety to a parent and especially to a mother. I've watched this with my wife many times where I'm troubled, but it keeps my wife awake at night, worrying and feeling the pain and the disappointment of a child who is going against what he or she knows is right. To bear the weight of that confrontation. It's something that is real, and I could talk to many of you ladies in the congregation. You have experienced some of those same things. It's a joy when, as John says in his second epistle, I have no greater joy than to know that my children walk in truth. But the converse of that is also true. That when our children are walking in rebellion and hostility towards God and knowing what is right, the heartache and the disappointment and the anxiety that we experience is truly a painful thing to go through. And I believe that is part of what God is trying to, to describe for us here. Not just the physical characteristics, but the reality of being a parent that will continue to follow you. And that, go, that doesn't just stop at adolescence. As you watch, many of you, I could talk to you even today, and I know that you will pray for some of your adult children who have been out of the home now for maybe longer than they were in the home. But you are still burdened for them and their relationship with God. And you have to learn to put your confidence in God and what He is capable of doing in their lives. And yet, knowing where they are and where they need to come, there is still a pain. There is still a sorrow. So what do we do with that? We cast our cares, we cast our anxieties on Christ. Because He, as Peter says, cares for us. He loves your child more than any of us ever could. And we learn through prayer. We learn through intercession. We learn through the exercise of faith and confidence in God to remember that God is still in control. But 
that's a painful lesson still to learn. That's the reality, I think, that God is bringing into the picture here when He tells the woman, your pain is going to be multiplied. It puts us in context here this morning in how we think as to what we should anticipate. The next thing that the judgment for the woman will remind us of is the desire. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. There's been many different speculations, different ideas of what that could be. I'm not going to cover all the different theories uh, this morning. I'm going to give you my conclusion, and if that doesn't match up with what you've heard other people say, I'm not going to apologize either, because there's not a lot of passages that really detail this. We have to think through, through what the text says in a limited fashion, but we also have to think through the lens of our own understanding about human nature, and we have to think through it in the terms of human experience. And the human experience interpretation that seems to make the most sense to me is when he says, when God says to Adam and Eve, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but that he shall rule over you, is he is laying the groundwork here to help us understand why do we have conflict in marriages. Why do we, and and I'm not even talking serious conflict. Sometimes it's just as simple as, okay, a couple of Sundays after church, my wife says, okay, all the kids are gone. They think they had gone to the swimming pool. They were supposed to go tubing, but the the river was high, and so they they ended up going somewhere else. But it was Jennifer and I and Dory. It's like, there's three of us. The house is empty. We ought to go out to eat. Well, where do you want to go? I don't care. Just go somewhere. I think we visited, we we went through a list of 12 different places. We ended up in a parking lot because I finally said, she said, just make a call. And so I go, okay, we're going to John Hardy's. We pull in there and I can just see on her face. Okay. We ended up going to uh, to, Pangea. to Los Arcos, which is a, was a great choice, by the way. I think we saw a couple of you there. So <laughs> it, I'm not regretting the choice. I would, have, I would have minded if she said that right from the beginning. But there was a little bit of conflict along the way. <laughs> and that's, that's a relatively innocent thing in the whole scheme of things. But husbands and wives, as you all know, those of you who are married, don't always immediately agree on everything. And there's a reason for that. This is what God is saying. Even as he's just looking back at what has just happened in the past, I believe. Why does Adam say that he ate of the tree? The woman, God, you gave me, gave me the fruit and I ate. He doesn't take the responsibility for his decision, he blames it on her. But whose authority was it? What we see both in the beginning, in the order of creation, Adam is coming first, then Eve. What we see laid out for us all through Scripture is the man is supposed to be the benevolent leader of his home. He is the head of the household. He is the head in the marriage. Now, being the head doesn't give him absolute dictator rights and that he can just walk all over everybody and say hey woman make me a sandwich it doesn't work that way that's not what the bible says guys by the way that's not what you should be uh, trying to wield in your household those of you single guys if you think it's going to work that way i have another thing coming for you we could give you some lessons on that but here's the reality the man is supposed to be the head of the household but he abdicates that responsibility. And not only does he not take the responsibility for that decision, he tries to slide that off and put the blame and the responsibility on her. And there is that competition that's there. She was deceived, but she also had her own agenda. She had her own thoughts. She knew what God had said, just like Adam did, but she fell for the line that the serpent offered. And there decisions 
whatever process there were, were still in conflict with one another. And I believe that's what God is getting at here when He says that your marriage is going to be not always perfect. You're not always going to agree. There are going to be times not only where you disagree, but you're going to disagree and voices are going to get raised. Feelings are going to get hurt. There's going to be bitterness and resentment. Sometimes one of you is going to be sleeping on the couch. And not that that's okay, but he's helping them realize this isn't all going to be rosy. This is God's judgment upon them. Judgment on the woman, but God also has consequences for the man. He says in verse 17, God says to Adam, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. So you abdicated your headship. You did not take the responsibility that you should have. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. And this is the reality that he gets into the description that many of us would experience even this summer as you've worked your garden. And all the measures that you go through, all the plastic or straw that you put down, inevitably there's going to be weeds that come up. Things that if you don't maintain are going to take over what you have worked so hard to plant. And that's just our backyard gardens. That's not to say anything of the, the little creatures that come and nibble off the fruit of your labor before you can pick at it sometimes, or the bugs and the insects uh, that come and sabotage your plants. The reality is this is not going to be easy. God's going to give us gracious gifts and things to enjoy. But God also says, because of what you have done, it's going to be difficult along the way. Verse 18, Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. This is part of what God has promised is going to happen. This is His explanation for why we go through this hardship. Not only is it going to be the weeds and the thistles and the things that are working against you, it's not going to be easy to work. Verse 19, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Yesterday, my sons and I got to... We're almost done. We've been working on this since late spring. We have a landscaping project. Uh, and so we had to clear out all the old rocks. We had to put in some retaining bricks and things. We have a nice little border around the backyard. And so yesterday, I think we got 50 bags of river rock from Menards. We ended up doing it in two trips. It was 88 degrees when we started. And I will tell you, by the time I was done, I could have taken out my t-shirt and probably wrung about half a cup of, of liquid out of there. Guess is, and that, I know everybody's really excited to hear that uh, this morning. But it was an accomplishment that we got that done. There was satisfaction in seeing that project finally through to fruition. But it was not always a pleasant process to have to work through. The end is rewarding. The effort is worth it. But we would have, there's a part of us that would have enjoyed having a, a nice little season, to have a few flakes floating around in the sky. Because it was hot. It was humid. It wasn't pleasant. That doesn't stop us from working, at least most of us. But it does make it unpleasant. It does make it more challenging. And friends, we need to understand that the reason that is is because of the consequences of our sin. It's a reminder that we messed up. Not just, when you, when you think through that, don't just think, man, it's going to be a hot day. Think, this is part of what God has brought upon us. But there's also something that we should be thinking through. There's coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. 
No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day. Glorious day that will be. Sing it with me if you know it. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon His face the one who saved me by His grace when He takes me by the hand and leads me to the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. That song goes on to sing, say that there will be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness no pain, no more heartache over there. But we know that there is today. Creation groans. We groan. Not just because of the sweat, not just because of the thorns and thistles, not just because of the pain of our relationships, but it's the reality of decline and death. All of us know what that is, whether we're experiencing it currently in our aching joints, in the pain and distress that we go through, or whether you're young and you haven't experienced that yet to the same degree that some of the rest of us do. You've seen it in others. You've experienced the heartache and loss of a relative who's gone through that. You know the unpleasantness, whether firsthand or secondhand. It's the reality of living life in this current situation. Death is something we all face. Death is something we will all encounter. The author of Hebrews says, It is appointed unto man to die once, and after that comes judgment. There is the pain. There is the weight. But Jesus came so that we could escape death. So that the curse, as we have learned in the last couple of weeks, could be reversed. And here's the reality, friends. As we have these assurances, these realities of pain and heartache and sorrow we must deal with, there's still the need for us to find joy because of the promise that we learned about last week that God is going to crush the head of the serpent. God is going to send a Savior to overcome. And we find joy in the blessings that Jesus brings to us even now before that eternal realization of that glorious day that we just sung about. The reality that Jesus gives us the answers of how we can avoid conflict with one another. How we can figure out with a child who is being difficult and contrary to cast our cares on Christ. How we can find blessings in the gratitude that we should have for the things that we worked hard for. But as Jesus would pray in His model prayer before the disciples, to give us this day our daily bread. And we know that the means is hard, but the reward is worthwhile. The reward is worth it. And what we remember in those small lessons is the reality that the promise that God gives us today is only a small foretaste of what we will have when we see Christ. The burdens will be lifted. The sorrows will depart. He will wipe away the tears from our eyes. And there will be no more sorrow. There will be no more pain. And there will be no more death. All of those things will have passed away. And we remember in the blessings that we experience, the small temporal blessings that ultimately Jesus has come to remove the curse. What we remembered here this morning 
at the communion table is what Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13 when he says that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. And you realize that what Jesus did was taste death for every man so that His death might give us life. That His pain in the broken relationship with those whom He loved, who turned their backs on Him, His broken relationship with His Father. My God, my God, why have You forsaken Me? was so we could be in harmony with those we love. was so we could have a restored relationship with the Father. It was so these curses that we still experience the residual effects to, we have the hope of one day they are going to be fully and completely removed. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. And friend, if you have not yet trusted in Jesus Christ, you need to understand that God is willing and able to both forgive you from the penalty of your sin, from the power that sin continues to maybe have in your life right now for some of you who are believers, and will one day completely remove you from sin's presence. The curse is going to be removed. And why? Because, as we have learned here in this conclusion, it is because Christ has become that curse for us. Christ has become that curse for us. That's the point I want you to remember here. The reality of these curses is real. But so is the relief that we have because of Jesus Christ. He and He alone is the answer to the problem that we face. We thank You, Lord Jesus, for giving up Your life on the cross so that we might have life. Your death made it possible for these things to be relieved from us. Though we face constant reminders of them now, We understand that there is coming a day, a glorious day, where all those things will be removed. So help us through the eyes of faith to see even now how you are softening the curses, how you are giving us blessings out of the difficulties and out of the trial. Teach us to trust in you. Teach us to rely on you. Your son told us, you have told us, Jesus, that we can experience, we can expect tribulation. We can expect difficulty. But we do not need to be afraid because you have overcome the world. The world passes away and all that's in it, but he who does the will of God will abide forever. So help us, Lord, to be obedient to what you've called us to, patient until you return. This we pray in Jesus' name.